Hey guys, Joe Sinodi here. Thanks for tuning in to another video. This video is titled, What You Need to Know About Mastering. Now, I would not refer to myself as a mastering engineer. I like to call myself an audio engineer. Now, I've definitely sent some projects to professional mastering houses in the past. I've gotten some good results and I've gotten some bad results. I wanna to talk to you about that. And then, towards the end of this video, keep watching because I'm gonna give you 10 steps that you can follow to get a good master if you can't afford to send it off for professional mastering. Let's dig into it. Okay, so like I mentioned before, I have definitely sent projects out for professional mastering, but I had some rough experiences. Some good ones too, but, but mostly rough. Uh, I'll explain. So I would send out a song and, and sometimes uh, an engineer, I'd get something back uh, and it sounded great. And sometimes I'd get it back and it was just really squashed and it sounded worse than my mix. Um, one time I even sent it out for mastering and I'm convinced they did nothing to it because it sounded exactly the same as my mix. And so what's the point there? I mean, unless my mix was that perfect, but let's be honest, it wasn't. So let me tell you a little story. Back in the day when I was getting started, anyone who was anyone, everyone sent their songs to Bernie Grumman for mastering. I mean, even if Bernie wasn't doing it, the whole mastering house was phenomenal and they're still doing stuff today. Um, I mean, he, he's the absolute best or at least was, I mean, there's a lot of good guys out there, but, um, I'll put a link to, uh, some credits of his down in the description. Just go check it out. You'll be shocked how many albums and artists that Bernie Grumman mastered. Um, but here's the thing they use 100% custom gear to master. If they didn't design it and build it themselves, then they bought it and they modified it. So we're talking about they're using tens of thousands of dollars of equipment that your song is running through. But fast forward to today, the technology has gotten so good you literally can't tell the difference in some, in some software. I, I know some, some aren't great, but in some software, you literally can't tell the difference between the analog and the digital version. Uh, examples that are just off the charts killer. Um, the Slate VMS, the whole virtual mic system. I mean, it's phenomenal. Uh, console emulations by Softube, Brainworks, Slate, Waves. UAD. I mean, the list is getting huge of things that are viable to sound like it's real analog gear. Since there's so much killer software out there, uh, there's a lot that we can choose from, but you have to be careful because some software or plugins claim to be the magic bullet to mastering and they honestly don't deliver. Um, I, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus and I'm certainly not sponsored by them, but take for example, the, the isotope stuff. Um, it's really designed for beginners. And I really wanted to try, I wanted to speed up the process of mastering for my own songs. And I've thrown it on and I've tried everything and I just can't get it to sound as good as I can get it when I just get rid of it and follow the steps that I've been using for years. Uh, and we're gonna go over those steps in just a few minutes. Online mastering services uh, are basically using the same type of algorithms as Isotope. So personally, I, I stay away from that. I stay as far as possible. Um, I'd rather just do it myself. But with all that said, you know, there's still things that you can learn from tools like that. They all kind of tend to have the same signal flow type. You know, it goes into an EQ and then it goes into like a multiband compressor and it does some stereo widening and it does the final limiting. You know, you can at least learn a good signal flow from uh, plugins like that. I mean, if you have no idea what you're doing and you can't afford to pay a mastering engineer, uh, then it's certainly better to use tools like that than nothing. So the question is, 
Why would you master your own song or even try to put your foot in the water, you know, and, and compete with companies like Bernie Grunman and, and killer mastering houses using tens of thousands of dollars of equipment? Well, you might compete because, I mean, you're on a budget and you certainly just can't afford to do that. You know, I wish I could on some projects. Some projects just, it's not in the cards. But I do think that the gap has certainly gotten smaller when it comes to gear. Don't call yourself a mastering engineer if you're just now starting out and learning what it takes to get a great master and all the steps that need to be followed. Because only then when you become a professional at that should you refer to yourself as a mastering engineer. So if you can't afford to send your song out to a professional mastering house, then that means you're on a budget. So naturally, one of the ways to save money is to master it yourself. So I want to at least help guide you in a good direction. Let me be clear. This is not a magic bullet. I'm going to show you some basic things, some ideas, some rules of thought, 10 steps to get a good sounding master, but you can use these steps in any DAW with any plugins. Okay, it doesn't really matter. I'm just giving you some guidelines. So save the emails. I just want to help those who are trying to figure this out themselves and you just aren't getting the results that you want. So without further ado, here are 10 things you need to focus on or keep in mind when mastering your own music. And right off the bat, I'm gonna give you negative one because I actually came up with 11 and I just thought they were too good and too important. So number negative one, make sure your mix has some headroom and it's clean and free of clipping. So when you're mixing and you're, you're finally rendering and bouncing to disc your song, make sure in the digital domain that you've got at least three, if not six dB of headroom for, from, uh, on your loudest peak. Okay, leave room for processing later on by mastering for EQ and, and other all, all sorts of stuff that could, could shift the gain structure. So leave room, let it breathe. It's okay, you'll make it louder later. Okay, now the real number one. Don't try and throw a pseudo master on your master fader when you're in mix mode. Here's my opinion. You should be wearing a different hat for every stage of the progress. In other words, if you're editing drums all day, then you should be wearing your editing hat. And if you're mixing, you wanna have all your editing done so you can take off that hat, put on, your mixing hat and you just focus on the mix. And then when you're ready to master, wait a day, be happy with the mix, listen to it, do all that, then come back, put your mastering hat on and in a fresh brand new session, you're gonna start mastering. Number two, use professionally mastered and nationally released songs to AB against. Um, make sure they're in the same genre, that they're a similar song, that kind of have the same energy, and make sure to level match them. Uh, if you look here in Pro Tools, I have got, um, this is my reference number one, this is my reference number two, and this would be the song that I'm mastering. This is all just pretend. This is actually, uh, I'm not really mastering this at all. Um, but... At any time I can unmute and mute my song and I can listen to the reference and go back and A, B and compare how mine is sounding compared to this other album that I really love. So in this case, I'm listening to like the main song. My main reference is Know Your Enemy by Green Day. Okay, because the song that I want, that I'm mixing, I want it to sound like that. So it would make sense to compare your master to that. Match the top end, the mid-range, the low mids, the lows, everything. Try and get the dynamics to sound similar. Don't reinvent the wheel. They already did it. It sounds killer. Just use it as a reference and try and make your sound like that. So that's point number two. Number three is this isn't surgery, okay? It should be like painting with wide, broad brush strokes, you know. Do subtle changes. So if you're EQing, use subtle half or one dB increments, 
you don't need to do a lot. You want to just think of the song as some clay that you're just sculpting. If you're having to go in there and perform surgery, it's because your mix is jacked up. So just go back and fix your mix and then come back and put on your mastering hat again and think about beautiful paintings <laughs> with a wide brush stroke. Step number four. No two songs will sound exactly the same. No matter how you mixed it, what gear it was on, each track sounds kind of different. So when you're mastering, um, like I have here in Pro Tools, I've got this track set up with its plugins. It's going straight to the outputs one and two. I've got a meter on output one and two. That's it. Here's my reference. So if I was going to do another song, I would duplicate this. Uh, to start, and then I'd obviously remove that waveform. I'd bring in the song that was song number two, and then this way, as I'm saving my session, I've, I've not lost the settings from the first song, and now I can AB my first song to my second song and make them sound similar and cohesive with each other. So you want to be ABing your own songs back and forth. Not to mention, if you want to come back and make any changes, it's already saved. You can just recall your session, tweak that little 1 dB thing that you want on song number four, and save it, render it out, and you're done. Tip number five, do corrective EQ first. Find what's standing out that you don't like and cut that out before you, you know, add stuff because you might find that by cutting out what you don't like will actually reveal and make room for the good stuff that you do like. So I always start by finding what there's too much of and I'll get rid of it. And then I'll ask the question, what do I want more of? Step six is compress gently. You just want to glue the mix, but only if it needs it. I mean, some songs have so much bus compression when they're mixed, you may not need to add any compression. It might be squashed too much already. You gotta figure out how to bring dynamics back into it. But um, multiband compressor is, is usually a, a good tool that you can control dynamics. Uh, and it's also a way that you can shape the sound. So maybe the EQs you were trying weren't really doing it, but when you start using multiband compression and turning the gain up on different frequency bands, you're able to sculpt it that way. Um, for instance, C6 by Waves uh, is one I use a lot. Here's what that looks like. Um, I've just got it bypassed, but so everything's bypassed. This is just an example of how I might use the C6 in a song. And again, every song is different. It depends. You'll get different results, but I just feel like maybe I have a problem at 94, so I'm just going to use this one little dip and cut out the 94. Here, let me turn this down so we don't have to hear it. And uh, I'll show you what that's doing. So here I've got just, you know, a little bit of this 94 being pulled dynamically as those frequencies are too hot. Other than that, I'm not actually using this. So that would be an example of how I might use a C6 in conjunction with a, you know, a standard compressor. So when I say gentle, just to glue, this is what I mean. So here's, here's what I'm doing with this. And I actually started with a preset, which is a really good preset, and then I just tweak it a little bit. Um, I'm just letting it run through. Because again, some of these plugins have gotten so good at, at emulating the gear, it actually sounds better just running through it. And that's true with this one. It's actually the case. It just sounds better already. So you don't need to do a lot. Just a little will go a long way. Number seven is stereo widening. It can really make a song have space and depth, but be careful because too much you know, can really sound bad quick. So let me show you a couple plugins that I would typically use to do some stereo widening. Uh, first was this EQ that I have on uh, as the first EQ. So I would have probably done, you know, I would use this for some corrective EQ. Um, but if you don't know, it actually has a mid-side 
feature. So I can say just add this EQ, this shelf to the sides or just add it to the middle. So by adding this shelf just to the sides, what I've done is I've brought up top in on the outsides and that's gonna give a sense of the mix being wider because you're gonna have all some pretty top end stuff in the side. So that's one way to do it. Uh, another one of my most favorite ways to do it is with this Brainworks uh, Digital. This thing is killer. It's got the mono maker. So talking about stereo width, well, getting things out of the stereo uh, spectrum that don't need to be there is one part of what helps your mix sound wider without actually doing any phase shifting of, you know, pseudo wi uh, widening. Uh, so here you can you can turn on the mono maker and set the frequency. So right now at 80 hertz, anything under 80 is going to get some to mono. So the bottom end of my floor tom and the kick drum and the bass, it's all going to be up the middle. And the attack and all that's going to be stereo and you're really not going to notice it because that bottom end is no longer directional at that point. So you're freeing up, you know, the differences between left and right by making those low frequencies mono. Uh, and then here, this has a stereo width output and you can just be subtle with it. I mean, 110, 120, it's 20%, whatever it is, it's just a little bit. And then I really like this going back to kind of wide scoops and being subtle is these shifts that you can do. This is the mono section and this is the stereo section. So the mid, so I can change that stereo shift by boosting some high mids and cutting some real top end or cutting some high mids and boosting some top end. Um, and same thing with the bass shift. I can pull some tub and add some low mid thump or I can pull some low mid mud and add some deep sub. Uh, but it's very broad, and so uh, this is one of my favorite, favorite widening tools. Tip number eight, don't be afraid to use automation when you're mastering. Do volume rides, automate the width, automate uh, changes in the amount of, of compression, you know, in certain parts. Um, you, you may not be able to just set it and forget it. Um, maybe you want the chorus to explode. So ride the verses down 1 dB and bring it back up 1 dB for the choruses. Um, just don't be afraid to experiment with automation because there's some things that you can still change and sculpt and help finish this song to really be its best. And, and that's, that's why I say, don't be afraid to do things like that. Ride volumes, make changes to compressors, just automate it and have some fun. And if you don't like it, undo it. Okay, number nine is a tough one. It's limiters. Be very careful, okay, because um, limiters will be the main thing that if you have it set wrong, you're gonna destroy your mix. Uh, there's some tips here, some pro tips for, for limiters. Listen at a low volume, okay? The distortion will stand out better at a lower volume when your ears aren't being just hammered by all this volume and you're maybe not noticing the distortion. Um, so listen at a lower volume when you're setting how much gain reduction or how much gain boost you're adding in a limiter. Uh, the second pro tip would be to make sure you're using any form of gain matching function if the limiter has it. Um, let me show you what I'm talking about. So the, uh, here we go, the slate, whatever this is called, uh, I forget what it's called, but it's awesome. <laughs> FGX. The Slate FGX, um, I use this on every song. I'm not going to lie. I use this on every song. Um, it sounds so good. I'll be completely honest with you. I don't use this compressor at all. I find that it is so vanilla that it, it almost decolors the mix, in my opinion. It's not transparent. It's anti-transparent. It's less than transparent. <laughs> so, sorry, Steven. But um, the, the leveling section here is just phenomenal. And right here is that button, constant gain monitoring. If that's not pushed, then you're hearing this gain. You're hearing this four, six, eight, 10 dB of boost, and it's going to give you a false sense that it sounds good right off the bat. So you want to make sure that you 
hit that button and you're listening to it where the volume isn't getting louder so you're not being tricked into thinking it sounds better. I, I did some mastering for an artist and they, they sent it off to a CD baby and I just assumed why not give them 20, 24-bit 48K wave files and they wanted 16-bit 44.1. Even though the artist wasn't pressing CDs, they still asked for that. So if that's the case, and maybe that was just, I don't know, but that's what they asked. So uh, make sure that if you are changing bit depth or sample rate is going down or up, but I doubt it'll be going up, probably down, um, use dither. And if you don't know what dithering is, this is not the video for that. Go Google it because it's really cool what it does. Okay, and then one other plugin here where you can set is, uh, let's see. No, I don't want to use the Pro Limiter. Let's bring up um, an L3. Here's how you can make sure that your game matching is just click on this little square right here when you're pulling down the gain. And it will pull the threshold with the out ceiling matched so that as you're hearing that gain reduction, you're not hearing it get any louder. Obviously, it should go without saying, but before you finish mastering your song, you're going to want to turn this up to whatever your ceiling is. It could be zero, it could be minus 0 0.1, it could be minus one, minus two. It depends on what you're doing, but make sure to turn that up before you finish. And tip number 10 or step number 10 is listen on as many speakers and systems as you can in your car, on your Bluetooth speaker, in headphones, on a clock radio, through your iPhone speaker sitting on the kitchen counter. Okay, do that until you've gotten so used to your room that you don't need to worry about it. You know what you're hearing is what is right. But until then, listen as, in as many places as you can. And then always compare it to your reference mixes. And a, a small side pro tip when it comes to your plugins is make sure that you're bypassing your plugins as you're changing something and listen to with and without. Make sure you're actually making it sound better and not making it worse. So that's number 10 is listen on as many systems as possible and don't forget to compare how your song sounds before and after and compared to others. All right, guys, that's it. That's the video that I was wanting to make. I, I hope that it's what you were hoping for. I hope that it helped. Uh, let me know in the comments, which of the 10 steps stood out to you? Which do you like the best and you wanna start making sure that you're trying? I'd like to know, leave a comment. And uh, just to let everyone know, because uh, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to still work and do this channel. So if you wanna support the channel, I now have a Patreon. You can go to Patreon slash Sedoti Sound. I'll put a link in the description. And of course, on my website, SedotiSound.com, you can buy merch like this killer hat. By the way, self-promotion, don't care. And, uh, and it'll really help support the channel, help me continue to make videos like this, and let's grow this channel together. All right, guys, as usual, smash the like button. I really appreciate it, and we'll see you on the next video.